Welcome. So um, as Jonna said, um, we, my colleague, Dr. Valtrina Miller and I, over the next 50 minutes, would like to tell you some stories, some stories about discoveries in One Health. So first, what is One Health? If that's not clear by now, let me explain. Of course, we're a school of veterinary medicine, so everyone thinks that we come into all problems and discoveries via the animal route, and, and of course, we, we oftentimes do. But the school of veterinary medicine um, is far more than just about animal health. Um, it's about the health of the humans that are so dependent on those animals um, as pets, as food, the wildlife that we enjoy. And we're also very concerned about, about the environment, the ecosystem that animals and humans share. So this is what we call One Health. It's this relationship between animals, humans, and the environment, the ecosystem they share. And what we've discovered here at the School of Veterinary Medicine is a lot of the most exciting discoveries can be made right here at the interface between these animals, uh, humans, and their environment. So I'd like to tell you some of those stories, and uh, we don't have time for all of them, so I'd first like to, to give you a few little teasers, like on the back of the book, to, uh, to let you uh, see some of the exciting um, discoveries that are being made, even here in this building. And let's start out with um, a fabulous French colleague of mine whose fascination with bacteria, particularly um, the little uh, bacteria Bartonella that causes cat scratch disease in humans, how that led to his discovery that fleas are an important vector for that um, organism. And then from that, he's gone on to discover uh, a whole number of new species of Bartonella in a variety of different hosts, wild and domestic, and that's led to his current studies on vampire bats, which you can see here feeding in Mexico on cattle, um, and to discover if they have new species of Bartonella and which ones are transmitted um, to uh, those and to and between those animals and to humans. That's what we call zoonotic disease transmission. And then we have Holly Ernst, who's here, um, whose uh, genetics laboratory works on a wide variety of One Health problems, all the way from the tiny little uh, trichinella worms that hide in the tissues of bears and can cause fatal disease in humans that eat bear meat, to uh, ferrets as a model for for some of the cancers that humans also have. Um, and then in the environment too, looking at the impact that some of our green technology, such as turbines, wind turbines, are having on the migration of species like um, bighorn sheep and mountain lions. And then one of my personal favorites are the studies being done, the discoveries being made on hummingbirds as sentinels, um, as sort of environmental samplers as they flit from, um, from our feeders to our trees to our flowers um, and what they're able to tell us in terms of the pesticides that are out there in the environment that will in fact affect our health and the health of our animals. Speaking of tiny little winged creatures, um, of course the mosquito um, is one of those and here um, we have only to look uh, up at the uh, Vector Genetics Lab at uh, what we call the Mosquito Mafia, um, led by Greg Lanzaro and Yusek Lee here um, with Anton Cornell from the College of Ag and Entomology, who are working at all of these sites across Africa, looking at the genetics of mosquitoes and their relationship to the um, parasite Plasmodium that causes malaria with the intent being to try through these discoveries to improve the health of communities across Africa. But you know, you don't have to go to Africa to encounter communities. You don't have to really look any further than your own gut because there's a whole community there that fascinates Bart Weimer. Um, this is a, a whole microbial, microorganism community that we call the microbiota. Um, in addition to leading a, a big project where um, Bart is sequencing over 100,000 pathogens, he's also looking at these normal bacteria, microorganisms in our gut to see how they interact with each other, how they're affected by pathogens, and also how they're affected by even the things that we eat and how those changes in their growth and metabolism affect our health. Another one of our faculty that's fascinated by microbiota is uh, Helen Raybould. And she's also keen on um, the relationship, the connection between what's going on here in the gut and what's going on in the brain, as you can see here. 
um, that gut-brain uh, connection, um, which by understanding that, some of the discoveries that they've made are revealing um, how we might better uh, control some of our own health problems and those of our animals, such as obesity, such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease or metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes. Um, and then how uh, what we call prebiotics like milk oligosaccharides and these probiotics that we can take um, can work together to actually improve the health of that microbiota and our own health. And then let's go out back out to the environment. Let's talk about um, pesticides, organophosphates that are critically important in a lot of areas for um, both plant and animal agriculture to control pests. Um, and we also use uh, organophosphates and rodenticides to control some of our indoor um, pests, such as rodents and cockroaches. Well, this is the, the area that Pam Line and her team have really delved into because one of the downsides of these um, chemicals is that they can affect the brain, they can cause severe convulsions. So, so what her team has been looking at is, um, is how to improve um, anticonvulsants to improve uh, and prevent um, seizure, seizures and treat them, um, and also to uh, better protect our brains from these pesticides, which are a big environmental problem. So these are just some of the stories that are taking place right here, even in this building, with investigators taking that animal-human environmental approach to health. So now in, in the remaining time before I hand over to, uh, to my colleague, Dr. Miller, I'd like to tell you uh, about, about a story that I became involved with um, in 1998. And to do that, we have to take you to the coast of California, to that area that's um, between about Santa Cruz down through the Big Sur coast, shown here down to Morro Bay, and tell you a story that, that I think has all the important ingredients of, of a, a good mystery story, um, which always starts out with one charismatic, attractive, central character um, who, just like in a mystery, and when we became involved in 1998, was, was dying um, tragically, um, mysteriously, and that po critical population, that, that age range, reproductive male and females, where their deaths had a big impact on the population. So this charismatic central um, uh, victim um, of, uh, of death um, is key to the story. But then, as we know, the other important part of a good story is you've got to have sex, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, that's all happening here in the intestines of these um, little uh, feline creatures because it's only here in the intestine of cats, wild and domestics, that our villain in this mystery can have sex, can reproduce, reproduce uh, sexually. And who is that villain? Well, it's a little tiny single-celled parasite called Toxoplasma gondii, one of the big villains. That, that, as I said, is tiny, only about the size well, of a white blood cell, fits inside a white blood cell. That's the stage that actually does the damage, that causes disease, that can infect any warm-blooded animal, mammal or bird, and, uh, and in any cell. Um, very successful parasite. And, and a very clever parasite, too, because when the host's immune system detects that it's infected with this parasite, Toxoplasma is able to insist to form a wall around itself and to hide in there where it doesn't stimulate much of an immune response. So this is the mysterious uh, tissue cyst stage that once infected, and I can say that here in this crowd, anywhere from 14 to 25 percent of the people here, depending on your age, may be infected with this parasite, is hiding quietly in your tissues. And then the third important stage of this parasite is that stage that's formed by sexual reproduction in the intestine of cats. And this is the egg-like oocyst stage. So if you understand those, those three stages, you can better understand how this villain in our story is so incredibly successful. So as I said, when we got involved in the Toxoplasma story, it was really because of Dr. Linda Lowenstein, who's right here who um, was uh, renowned for her uh, wildlife pathology, particularly having to do with marine mammals. And so sea otters were sent to the University of California, Davis, and, that, and she was the first to discover Toxoplasma gondii as the cause of death in, uh, in two of those sea otters. And, and that's when we became involved. But, but why did we all jump into this and get so involved? Well, for one, sea otters are kind of cute. 
uh, very charismatic, and probably that has a lot to do with why they are an iconic species that you see on most of the tourist literature that comes from California. They're also um, a threatened species, federally listed threatened species. But there's another really good reason why we care about sea otters, and that's their important impact on the environment, on the, the coastal ecosystem. Because um, I think most of you probably know we have a very healthy um, giant kelp forest off the coast of California. But what you may not know is that kelp forest is really critically important to prevent erosion, coastal erosion. Um, and it's also an important habitat for a wide variety of, of fish and marine mammals. And one of the great threats to the kelp forest um, has historically been sea urchins because sea urchins feed on kelp. And, and if their population is not controlled, they can actually destroy, as they did at one time in our history, a lot of the kelp forest. Fortunately, sea otters like sea urchins. And, and this is one of their prey species. So as long as the sea otter population is healthy, then the sea urchin population can be kept under control and our kelp forests can be healthier. So again, an important impact on the environment. But another reason why we got so interested in, in this whole question was as we discovered the role of toxoplasma, we know that that's important for human health as well. And, uh, and a lot of people get infected with toxoplasma, but it, as I said, many of you here may have been, but we don't even know in most cases when we get infected because most people infected with toxoplasma are asymptomatic, no clinical signs, or they have a flu-like illness and never even think of a parasite, most likely think of a virus. But there are some populations that are at greater risk of actually developing disease, and you may have heard of one of them, and that's pregnant women. Women who get infected for the first time when they're pregnant um, can actually, uh, without adding to their fetus, end up with fetal infection, fetal death, miscarriage, or um, equally bad congenital um, defects um, in their uh, babies, such as hydrocephalus, blindness, cognitive brain damage. Um, the other population of people who are at risk of disease are those who are immunosuppressed, and that could be um, people who have uh, severe HIV um, <laughs> immunosuppression, uh, people who have to be immunosuppressed because of tissue transplants. Um, this can be anyone who um, was infected at any time in their life has those parasites in their tissues, and then that immune control is relaxed, and the parasite can come out, leave those tissue cysts, and cause severe, even fatal encephalitis. So the human population cares about, about toxoplasma as well. So what our studies showed, oh, beginning in 1998, um, was that the most likely source of infection for sea otters was probably there is that uh, oocyst stage in feces because sea otters don't eat any of the warm-blooded prey that would be intermediate hosts for toxoplasma. So this is the most likely way that they're getting infected. And as a result, we know where those oocysts are coming from because they can only be coming from wild or domestic felids. So when we um, conducted a study, and this was led by Melissa Miller and Chris Coyter Johnson, who um, is here at the One Health Institute, what those epidemiological risk factors say showed was that um, toxoplasma risk was um, most significantly associated with freshwater outfall. That was a major risk factor. In other words, where water is washing off the land by rivers, streams, into the ocean, that, that it, sea otters that were in those areas with the heaviest outfall were the ones that were most likely to have um, toxoplasma infections. Well, back when that was discovered, it received a huge amount of media attention not just in California, but nationally and internationally. And it was really surprising to us. We weren't prepared for that because, I mean, Cal these sea otters only occur in California. But what we discovered was that this story was far bigger than just about sea otters. Um, this is a story because we know where the parasites are coming from. Unlike a lot of, of other contaminants and infectious disease agents that can have a lot of different sources, because we know they must be coming from cats, we knew that there was a land to sea connection. And, and although that seems obvious now, at the time, a lot of people weren't thinking that way, including ourselves. But it helped to alert us all to the fact that disease-causing agents like this protozoa, but quite likely other disease-causing pathogens as well, on land 
um, coming from, from us or our animals can actually have an impact on, on ocean inhabitants. So in this case, we talk a lot about, about emerging infectious diseases coming from uh, pathogens coming from wildlife. Well, in this case, the sea otter is not the source. The wildlife's not the source. The sea otter is the victim. But the sea otter is something more than that. It's actually a sentinel. Because sea otters spend their entire life within about a half a kilometer of the coast, um, and, and they feed on a, some of the same prey that we enjoy, oysters, uh, clams, mussels, those kinds of things. Sea otters actually are very good sentinels for environmental contamination, especially with what we're talking about here, what we um, call biological pathogen pollution. So, so this is a story that impacts not just sea otters, but it's what sea otters are telling us about our environment um, that's going to impact our health, the health of other marine mammals, um, and any of us too that not only share the habitat, but share the prey um, that sea otters um, enjoy. So as with all good One Health stories, it takes a team. When there's a complex problem like this, this is one of the fundamental principles of One Health. It's transdisciplinary research. It's a complex problem and, uh, and it takes a team. So, so this, to really tackle the problem of, of toxoplasma infection in sea otters, we, um, we recruited coastal oceanographers, uh, molecular parasitologists, chemists, hydrologists, environmental engineers, and more um, to get all of those different disciplines. We had many different collaborators. Um, we drew heavily on the University of California Davis, our home, and the Bodega Marine Lab, which is part of UC Davis, but many other really important collaborators so that we could tackle this problem. And one of the great benefits of bringing a team like that together is the student training that we can do, this transdisciplinary training that our students are, are able to participate in. So the rest of the story, I'd like to focus on three of the, the products of that transdisciplinary training, on three of, of the, the, the One Health practitioners that we're proud to have, have trained here in, in the School of Veterinary Medicine. Heather Fritz, Liz Van Warmer, and Karen Shapiro, they're all veterinarians who all have completed their PhDs. Uh, Liz, just here in the last year. Um, and so let me just tell you about some of the important discoveries that they've made. These three gals together have led projects that have, have focused all around the toxoplasma osis in one way or another, from where it came from to how it's, uh, it's running across the land and into the ocean, directly affecting sea otters, and also how it's vectored by some of the sea otter prey. So first, let's take Heather. So um, Heather in her, during her PhD work, was the first to publish the protonome and the transcriptome of um, toxoplasma osis that nobody else had done. And she's gone on now as a faculty member to, uh, to take the osis and develop um, what we call monoclonal antibodies, specific antibodies that detect specific antigens on the osis, and then use those first and very importantly to try to detect osis. You can imagine when you're trying to find a little parasite that's only 10 microns, the size of a white blood cell and in a gigantic ocean like this that's like looking for a needle in a haystack and we ha and the only way to do that is to be able to concentrate those parasites but by having those antibodies we're able to bind them to little beads and then put them in with water samples and using a magnet and these little beads be able to actually concentrate the, the parasites and then detect them it's also giving us clues to what might be the weak link in these oocysts. I didn't get a chance to tell you, but these oocysts are incredibly tough. You can store them in 10% formalin, 100% bleach, and for overnight or days, take them out, wash them off, they're fully infective. That's how tough they are. So finding a weak link that can actually destroy those oocysts is critically important. And then also looking for the potential perhaps of developing a vaccine um, because because we said cats are the only animals that can shed these oocysts if there's some way that we can find the vulnerabilities of the oocysts in their formation and prevent them from being formed we might be able to prevent oocyst shedding 
Then what about Liz? Wow, Liz has been a super graduate student. Everything from molecular to modeling, and the major focus of her PhD was on modeling toxoplasma gondii transmission from land to sea. And what she did here was, was build on the, the work of a previous graduate student, Heidi Dabritz, who looked at owned cats kept indoors and outdoors. And Liz focused on feral cats, um, and also on the wild felids that we have in California, bobcats and mountain lions. And, and so in her work on feral cats, she found it very important. Um, and here I'm going to share with you some unpublished data. She just submitted the paper this week, but she's um, given us permission to share it with you. And I think it's, it's really important. She looked at, at um, these, what we call managed feral cats, feral cats that lived close to urban and peri -ur in, in peri-urban areas, close enough to where they're, they're fed by um, a lot of, of people who like to uh, maintain um, colonies of, of feral cats or feed individual cats. We called those managed feral cats as opposed to the unmanaged feral cats that were found further away from human habitat where they're unlikely to get any human food and have to rely on, on eating rodents and birds, which are a prime source of toxoplasma um, cysts. So these unmanaged feral cats um, and also the wild um, felid populations. And on these, Liz looked at, at um, the prevalence of toxoplasma, the shedding of toxoplasma oocysts, estimating the number of oocysts that they were shedding, and also considering the cat numbers. And the big conclusion from her work was it, were, it was this population, the unmanaged feral cats that really were making a, the most significant contribution, along with owned cats that are kept outdoors to oocyst environmental contamination. But Liz didn't stop just with the felids. She also looked at the environment. Um, and, uh, and here you can see a map of California. You can see the green areas, the coastal watershed that, that accompanies the sea otter range right along here. And in this area, there's all kinds of different landscapes, different land use, all the way from agricultural to wetlands, forested, and then also, of course, urban and peri-urban areas. And, and here again, this is uh, data, gonna, that, uh, an exciting paper that will soon uh, be coming out. And she looked at five um, uh, what we call sentinel watersheds uh, are circled here. And, uh, and they included, in some cases, urban areas, also agricultural areas, and, uh, and undeveloped areas, a little bit of, of all in, in the five different areas. And she. Um, and here it is, we summarize some of the, the data right here. Let me try and make it simple. If you actually are looking at oocysts that are reaching the ocean, because that's the key for us, what is reaching the ocean um, to, uh, that might actually infect sea otters? As you can see, the wild felid comp uh, uh, contribution to this, the black area right here, is really very small. Though they shed a lot of oocysts in some case, it's a small contribution compared to all of the purple, which are the um, domestic cats, uh, owned and feral cats, in these five different areas. And precipitation, that affects the, um, the, how many of the oocysts actually get to the ocean. But the bottom line here is it was land use change. When we look at the baseline of land use in 1990 compared to land use in 2010, you can see that land use change had the most dramatic impact, especially when combined with precipitation, on how many oocysts actually make it to the ocean. So overall, the purpose of this model, this is not just an academic exercise, the purpose um, is really to use this model to try to figure out how management changes could impact the risk of oocysts um, getting to the ocean and affecting sea otters, or actually just getting out into the environment. So those kinds of management strategies, um, feral cats, whether we keep our cats indoors, let them outdoors, whether we manage feral cat populations or not, leaving them to, uh, to prey on their own, how we manage our land, how much we, the impact of development, the impact of, of uh, reconstructing wetlands, the ones that we, maintaining the ones we haven't destroyed or reconstructing the ones that, that um, in areas where they have been destroyed, that's really the purpose of the model. And then Karen Shapiro. Karen, wow, she has taken us to all new heights. From the time she started her PhD, she was the first person to really look at, at the physical characteristic of oocysts and what made them travel 
um, the way that they did, what made them interact with the environment and water in the way that they did. And one of her important discoveries was the impact of estuary and wetland wetlands on the flow of um, toxoplasma oasis and showing that that wetland degradation which is what's taken place all over california and actually this the united states and the world had a very significant impact in these modeling models on the um, oasis that actually make it to the ocean because these wetlands and their veg vegetation can do a great deal in terms of slowing the oasis and preventing them to go forward and, and actually to fall down and be destroyed within the wetlands. Now, since she's become a faculty member as a co-investigator on, on an NSF, the College of Infectious Disease grant, she's taken us even further, deep into the ocean, Karen has, um, where her studies on how toxoplasmaosis and other pathogens aggregate in the ocean and, and combine with, with particles um, in what's called marine snow, if you've heard of that, in aggregates, and how those um, are, are affected by different factors, including um, chemicals that are in the ocean and what's produced by, um, by, uh, by um, the giant kelp have all um, play a role in, in what this movement of pathogens toxoplasma and other pathogens. And why this is important for us? Well, for me, it, it solves a big mystery. You know, we have always wondered, so cats produce a lot of oasis, but the ocean is huge. You know, why is it that over 30% of the sea otters in California are infected with toxoplasma? Because you'd think that the, those oasis would be diluted in the ocean. That's been our principle all along. That's why we dump so much of our sewage into the ocean, because we figure it's all going to be diluted. So it's obviously not if over 30% are being infected. So some of our, our studies showed that, that filter feeding bivalves, like this mussel that the otter is holding, can actually, uh, as they're filtering, filtering large amounts of water, can actually concentrate those oasis. So we thought, well, that would explain the problem. But then more recent studies by, by Chris Johnson and Tim Tinker on our team showed, no, in fact, it wasn't the bivalves that were the greatest risk factor, although we know that they can concentrate and harbor viable oasis. But in fact, it was these guys, the snails, that, that sea otters that ate greater, that, um, that out more than 30% of their diet was composed of snails actually had a 12 times greater risk of being infected with toxoplasma. So, I personally couldn't figure that out until we started to get these data from Karen's studies, which actually show and help show more about what's happening in the ocean, what's happening on the giant kelp, where these snails are feeding. And to support Karen in these efforts, we have another um, great former graduate students. And this is also to show you that this is not all a, a female operation. We have a few brave men that venture into the lab on occasion. And one of those brave men is Colin um, Cruiser, who um, has taken this on as one of his projects. And through his innovation, has actually created what I marvel at, these snail condos. They, they no longer have an ocean view, but they do have wonderful privacy and a nice supply of kelp in which the snail can deposit copious amounts of feces, um, poop as we call it in our lab, and in which um, we've been able to uh, discover, Colin has, there are lar there's a large concentration of oasis. When oasis are in the water, these snails feeding on the kelp can actually concentrate those oasis, and fortunately they autofluoresce so that you can see them right here. Now, personally, I've been delighted by these discoveries because it's moving our lab further away from, from cat poop and now into the realm of snail poop, which for us is a step forward. So without uh, any more on this, I'd like to uh, go ahead and hand over to my colleague, Dr. Valtrina Miller, who's going to keep you on the California coast for, for just a little bit longer, um, talking about uh, some of her studies and discoveries and those of her team, but then take you far beyond to other parts of the world. You got pockets? There we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's lovely to see everybody. So Pat's done a wonderful job um, introducing you to some of the exciting One Health projects that we've got going on in California. I'll do just a tiny bit more of that, and then I'll take you to a couple of our international study sites so you can see what's going on in different places of the world as well. 
Okay, so we're going to go to Northern California here, and we're still talking about this land-sea interface. We're very interested in how pathogens move from these coastal areas on land and then get down into the ocean where we have the sea otters as a sentinel species that we're quite interested in. So one of the things that I really, that motivates me in One Health Studies is helping the students make new discoveries. And so as with Pat's, I'm gonna highlight a couple of the students that we've got that have been very involved in these projects because it really is a team effort for all of these things. So Jennifer Hogan is um, an EPI student and um, graduated last year. She really focused on wetlands at this land-sea interface as her passion. And one of the things that she really liked about that was trying to figure out not just how can we characterize health problems, but how can we evaluate solutions? How can we figure out ways to improve health for people, for animals, and for the environment? And so one of the areas that she focused on for her studies was looking at dairy wetlands along the coast. And so by taking specific samples at different locations along these wetlands that were placed between dairies and the, the rivers downstream, she could look at the importance of distance, try and come up with ideas like you can see in this figure that as the distance increases, the number of parasites goes dramatically down. So maybe farmers can make specific recommendations to go ahead and plant buffers or plant wetland areas in certain kind of locations along their properties that are going to help to improve water quality downstream, even if they know that they may have calves on their farm that are likely to shed these parasites. So, so Jen was very excited about combining the field and the lab to really make new discoveries that relate to the problems and solutions of pathogen pollution. So beyond the dairies, she went and looked at specific constructed wetlands. This is another coastal study site we have near Santa Cruz. And on the right side here, you can see the starred areas, which are different locations along the snake-like part of a surface wetland. And then there's another subsurface area below. And so she could take samples over time in field conditions for California and really look at how do the pathogens move, how is distance and water quality affected by different risk factors, whether that's time of year, whether that's distance, whether that's type of pathogen. And so we were finding that parasites move differently than bacteria. The dynamics in the, in the wetland are different for these different types of pathogens, and that helps us to understand what we might predict in the future. So another big part of those studies and making discoveries was to work in a more controlled environment. And you work in the field, there's lots of things that are at play and sometimes you have a hard time really figuring out what are the most important factors that affect the movement of pathogens. So we took it to the lab. We created tanks, mesocosm tanks, working with fish and game down in Santa Cruz. And so this is an area where we do a lot of sea otter work anyways, but they're really enthusiastic about working together. And so building these tanks and having multiple funding sources to put these pieces <coughs> together from Sea Grant, from the state, from federal sources as well, we can then say, okay, we want to figure out how Cryptosporidium and Jardia in this case are affected by these factors that we see in field wetlands, but now we can manipulate them. We can look at, is temperature important? Is type of vegetation important? Is the way that you plant things in a wetland important for controlling water quality and improving health? And so here she was able to really show that if you have vegetation, the configuration doesn't actually matter that much. You could have a channel or you could have a, a, a buffer all the way across. Just having the vegetation there at all makes a huge difference in the number of parasites that are in the water. So really, if we can look at ways to revegetate to work towards a wetland system instead of all of the, the flat surface where you have the water just running straight into the ocean, that may really help with improving water quality along the coast. And so she's thinking about it in ways of, you know, what are the bigger implications? Can we use these controlled studies and discoveries that we make here and then be able to extrapolate into larger policy changes or to help inform on management recommendations? So we know we've had a big loss in wetlands along California and in other places as well. But there may be ways that we can use our science to help really motivate people to look at ways that we can more sustainably improve ecosystem health and by extrapolation improve animal and human health as well. Okay, so let's go abroad. Let's go over to Tanzania. This is the site where we have the Health for Animals and Livelihood Improvement Project, which is based in the South Central area. But we're also very excited that we now have some new collaborations in the North. So the Nelson Mandela Institute, African Institute for Science and Technology, is one of our partner institutions. And this is a new graduate school in Arusha. And so they have a very innovative faculty who's ready to try new things. And, and that's been wonderful to go back and forth with them because they want to really partner, they want to do One Health. And so we're doing some of the things that we've been taking on with wetlands in California and we're now trying it in Tanzania. 
And so that's an exciting thing for us because all the lessons that we learned here with what works and what doesn't work in field studies and lab studies, that helps us to do a better job in these foreign sites where it's even harder to work. So we're partnered with faculty and with students there and, and they're twinned with our students as well. And so they can then work together to try and evaluate, okay, what's happening with water quality in wetlands, with animal health, with, hu with human health in Tanzania in this particular place. So we have some new seed grants that are just starting this year that's letting us start to apply this in the north. The place where we've been working since 2006 that John and Mazette was really the one to start is this Halley pro program that a lot of you may have heard about already. And this is an area where we've really tried to, to build on a number of different projects that can address different parts of One Health. So we started on the animal side by partnering with a veterinary school there. There's only one, one vet school, Sokoini University of Agriculture and they have had a wonderful faculty member who's essentially Jana's equivalent there. And so by partnering, they've been able to build these programs in parallel. And so we do exchanges, we have Tanzanians, we have Americans working together in a number of different um, projects, but they all help each other out. So I'll give you a quick look at a couple of those. So one of the findings or discoveries, that's not surprising in hindsight, but we really wanted to go after it and get some data to support it, is, is the importance of water. Not just for livelihoods and the day-to-day -day living situation, but also with regard to health and how pathogens move. So one of the projects that we were doing initially um, in Tanzania was looking at the importance of whether you collect water in water holes that are affected by animals mainly, livestock and wildlife, humans um, with their water holes or areas more distant to those places. Would we see a difference in how polluted the waters were? Could we understand how the pathogens move? And really we looked in these areas where you have parks where the wildlife are, um, are safe you, and it's an interface with the villages where animals and people are living very closely together. It's fairly impoverished. So there's a lot of interaction and um, it's a really fascinating area to work. And of course what we were finding there is that, that water is critical. And so what we would test upstream where you think maybe that's going to be a cleaner area was not necessarily the case. We could look at risk factors, which you can see listed here, and say, are there certain times of year that are a higher risk for having polluted that we could start to understand? And really the pathogens were very widely distributed. So there are certain risk factors that are significant, but bacteria as general indicators of fecal pathogen pollution, that's a broader indicator versus salmonella that you see here is a more specific pathogen. And we don't always see the same risk factors for those two things. So what that tells us is just looking for fecal indicator bacteria isn't necessarily enough to really tell you all about human health risks, even though we would love to have one really simple test for that. You probably need to look at a few different things and think about um, how are you more holistically gonna test for that. So culture drives health. This is one of the really important discoveries that we've been seeing time and again when it comes to all of these different projects. Um, it's not as simple as just going out to see what's going on with a particular disease in an animal. You need to look at really how are those animals interacting with, with the households, with the environment in that area. And so that will help you to more holistically implement change. And so for the, um, the studies we've got going on now, which are USAID funded, looking at nutrition and livelihoods, the Emerging Pandemic Threats Program with PREDICT, all of these projects are really looking at these interface ideas, animals and humans interacting. So for Tanzania, with PREDICT, there's a lot of really interesting new discoveries going on, specifically looking at rodents and bats because they're so good at living with us, right? They, they live in these interface areas very easily. And so people who live close to certain host species or, or have different risk factors going on, they're gonna be particularly vulnerable for these new diseases to emerge, right? If you're eating bushmeat or undercooked things, that's gonna put you at higher risk for getting certain diseases. So thinking about how culture drives health is gonna help us develop new solutions as well, right? Can we translate the science that we're doing, the findings that we're making in the lab and really make that locally relevant? That's one of the big challenges and that's one of the reasons these transdisciplinary teams are so important. Okay, so one of the other projects that we've got going on right here is um, a National Institutes of Health project. Again, looking at how pathogens move, looking at what are some of the new discoveries we can make with regard to tuberculosis. So we have teams where we have physicians, we have veterinarians, we have you know, policy makers involved at the higher levels, and we're really looking at how do the pathogens move in Tanzania in these pastoral societies where you have humans living very closely with livestock and with wildlife, and in these environments where it's really dry, water is very scarce at certain times of year, so everyone is sharing the same water holes, 
And then at other times of year, you have flooding situations. And so the pathogens can move very easily during those times. So there's really interesting things going on, collaborating with UC Davis, with the Tanzanian universities, as well as with universities in the UK, where we're trying to learn more, especially about the role of the environment with regard to zoonotic tuberculosis and human tuberculosis. Okay, so we'll make one more trip over here. We're gonna go to India, the East Coast, Arissa State. So this is another project that I've got going right now. This is Gates funded, and this is Miles Daniels on the right. So he's a current Epi PhD student. And he's working with um, a student and faculty member as well in India, trying to look at really the role of animals in this fecal pathogen pollution problem. So this project started as a London School project, trying to evaluate how well the government campaign to put in latrines in certain areas of India, how well is it working? Can you improve human health by changing cultural practices, by improved sanitation? But they realized once they started that project that they weren't thinking at all about the role of the animals, even though these are people who live very closely with their animals in very rural settings. It was all ignored. And so they brought on a whole new study, which is what we're doing now, looking at the role of animals and the role of the environment and how pathogens move. And so that's something that um, we're right in the middle of right now. We've done a monsoon season last year. We've got another one coming up. And we're trying to look at different places within the study system in a case control style so that we can look at what are the different sources for fecal pollution and how can we try and make recommendations to improve health using this One Health approach. So in this particular area, the dynamics that they have at play is a monsoon season where there is a big flooding situation, but then other times of year where the water is a, a very different dynamic. And so if you think about how are you going to deal with fecal pollution, right, you have animal sources from the livestock, you also have human sources, all of that contributes to the environment. This is a culture where open defecation has been the norm, and that's why this latrine intervention is so targeted and, and so exciting for them to really try and improve health. Diarrhea is a big problem there. You have different types of wells that people use. You have different household practices that are at play. And so this study very particularly looks at all of these different control points and says, okay, how can we figure out what are the most important places that we can intervene to try and improve health, improve water quality? And a big part of why they got us involved was this interest in microbial source tracking. A lot of new systems are coming out with technology that lets us distinguish between human fecal sources and particular types of animal fecal sources. So if we can say it's the dogs or it's the cows or it's the people that are causing problems in these areas, that helps us to design management strategies specifically for that. So those are very practical discoveries that we want to put into practice with new recommendations. And lastly, as far as a take home message there, Really, the reason we like these transdisciplinary studies is that nothing exists in isolation, right? The whole motivation of One Health is the idea that we can work together to try and understand connections, consider the natural sciences that's very easy for a lot of us to think about, but, but more challengely, challenging to really talk with others and learn about the social sciences and how to link all of these different things together in new ways. So that, I think, is the potential of One Health and where the direction we need to go to keep making new discoveries. Okay, so I'll hand off to Pat so she can do a little wrap up here, but I just want to leave you with that thought that there's a lot of exciting stuff going on both in California and abroad, and certainly the students are a big motivating factor in why we all come to work every day. So thank you for all of you who are mentoring graduate students and making a difference there. I feel like this is my holsters. <laughs> So I think, uh, as Valtrino says, um, health doesn't, doesn't uh, take place, improved health doesn't take place in a silo, um, neither does, uh, does good research. And, uh, and that's why we're so excited about what's happening here in the health sciences complex um, and the, with the School of Veterinary Medicine. Because cause these, we've shared with you that some stories that we've been part of and that, that others are writing right now. But stories like this are taking place all through the School of Veterinary Medicine and, and with our partnerships and collaborations on campus and off. So, so here, um, all the way, all of our different buildings, all of our different faculties, one of the most exciting things is that, that now 
we have the rest of our family here. Um, almost everyone will be moved into this uh, health sciences complex, um, which creates an environment that, that is most conducive to this transdisciplinary research we've been talking about um, that will dramatically facilitate our ability to write new One Health stories, to make new discoveries and add on to the ones that we've already been making, and to accomplish our mission of the School of Veterinary Medicine, which is to advance the health of animals, people, and the environment. Thank you all very much.